We are in the book of Ephesians. This is lesson number four. Lesson number four. Today we'll actually get into the book. So um, uh, while you uh, are looking at that sheet, uh, we'd ask you to take out your Bibles also at Ephesians four, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter one, we're in lesson four. And uh, the scriptures will also be put up on the, uh, on the screen, so you can either follow the screen or follow, your, follow in your own Bibles. All right, well, <clears throat> we, um, we reviewed the fact that the Ephesian letter was written by Paul the Apostle while he was in prison uh, in Rome between 61 and 63 AD. Talked about the history of when this was written uh, last week and the week before. It was uh, delivered to the city of Ephesus by Onesimus, who was a slave uh, who had been converted uh, in the Roman prison by Paul and then released at some point. And so he took the letter to Ephesus, uh, also took a letter back to his uh, master, Philemon, uh, who lived in Colossae. And um, uh, the connection there is the uh, Colossae is about 100 miles west of Ephesus, so he also brought the letter to Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus, we said, was a key congregation in a key location, and much of the evangelization of that area began from that point in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus flourished as a church, but in time it began to lag in its original zeal. So a warning was given to it by John the Apostle some 30 years later in his book, uh, uh, the um, Revelation, his book called The Revelation. He talks to Ephesus and warns them about their lack of zeal. Anyways, back to the, uh, the writing of this letter. After Paul left Ephesus, uh, as a matter of fact, John the Apostle came to work and he settled in Ephesus and he was there until his last days. So that church, significant church, uh, influential church as far as the spread of the gospel is concerned, two apostles that we know of who had a kind of a, you know, a base there to, uh, to do their work. The book of Ephesians can be divided in several ways and I gave you one such outline last week. We went over that last week. Um, uh, if you wanted to break down this uh, particular letter, you could say uh, the first part, uh, the blessings that are available in the church. Secondly, the universality of the church. Thirdly, the obligations of the church, and under that third section there were, there were some subheadings, obligations of the church, unity, righteousness, and faithfulness. So just by the outline, you can, you can see right away that the book of uh, Ephesians is about the church, very much about the church. So if you wanted to study you know, about the church, its character, its goals, so on and so forth, you would take a look uh, at the uh, letter to the Ephesians. But the thing to remember about Ephesians is uh, that it focuses on the importance of the church in God's plan. You know, some people say, oh, the church is not important. I can, you know, I can worship God. I don't need the church. And as I mentioned to you before, anyone who says that uh, obviously has not read the New Testament carefully and certainly has not studied the letter to the Ephesians. So in his letter, Paul says four main things about the church. Number one, that the creation and the blessing of the church was the objective that God had from the very beginning of time. Anyone who says the church isn't important doesn't realize that God considered the church very important because it was his goal from the beginning of time, from before the beginning of time, to bless the church. Another thing that Paul will talk about is that the true, uh, or rather that true living can only be experienced as a member of the body of Christ and that everyone could be a part of that body. He emphasizes that idea. True life is within the church. A lot of people, you ever hear people say sometimes, I don't know how folks do it, you know, who are not Christians, who are not part of the church. I don't know how they manage their lives. What they're really saying is what Paul is talking about here. True life, the true experience of the life that God designed for us as spiritual beings 
is experienced in the church. Third thing he says, that the church is the light in society insofar as setting the standard for what is right or how to treat one another and the revelation of Christ um, in, uh, in His word. You know, we don't, we, uh, one of the problems that we're always fighting against is to, is to not become so insular in the church. You know, we live in this bubble here and the only people we know are other Christians. The only people we talk to are other Christians. You know, we have to fight that natural tendency because part of the role of the church in society you know, when Jesus says you're the light of the world, he's not only talking about the light that like we ought to love our enemies, we ought to love each other, that kind of light, but also the light that says this is right and this is wrong. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always disappointed when I see someone who doesn't believe in God stand up and speak truth to power. That's the role of the church in society. And then a fourth thing that he taught, we'll get into that, and the fourth thing he says is that in the end the church will arise as victorious over every physical and spiritual enemy, including death. So four main ideas that he talks about in this epistle. So I've given you an outline and I've also given you some uh, you know, broad ideas or concepts that are, that are talked about here. So keeping all of this in mind, let's go into the first chapter, examine the first part and that is the blessings that Paul says are reserved only for the church. So let's open Ephesians chapter one. He begins with a greeting, verse one and two. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as was the custom, Paul introduces himself at the beginning of the letter. Today we sign at the bottom, yours truly at the end. In those days the letter started with that. Hello, I'm Paul, or hello, I'm Michael, and then you know, so on and so forth. So he, it's a normal way to start a letter. Note that he also establishes his own credibility and authority as an inspired apostle. He's not self-appointed, he's appointed by God. So right away from, from the very beginning, he's speaking with authority. He also recognizes them uh, as faithful saints. And that's not necessarily unusual, but in other letters, Paul doesn't necessarily do that for the church that he's talking to, because many times they had problems, like 1 Corinthians, you know, when he's talking to the Corinthians. You know, he, he pretty, pretty soon in the first chapter, you know, he says, I'm, I'm surprised you're abandoning the gospel. You know, right away, he gets down to it immediately. But the Ephesians, they were faithful. Um, they were a church that was, uh, that was uh, uh, dear to him. Again, he completes his greeting with a familiar blessing, grace and peace from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace was that quality of God that led God to offer salvation through the death of His Son. You know, God could have, could have simply chosen universal condemnation, that's it. Either you live perfectly or you're condemned, but he offered another way. He offered the way of grace that we could be forgiven uh, on the basis of faith in Christ. And so when he just uses the word grace, there are a lot of things that are compacted into just that word. And remember, he's speaking to people who are members of the church. He's not speaking to non-believers. He, he assumes that believers, his readers, will understand the, the potential of that word grace. And then the word peace, was the result of that gracious action on God's part. The idea is that there would now be peace between all men who believed in Jesus. Peace between those men, the, those people, and God. And there would also be peace in every saved person's soul. You know, one of the benefits of salvation is the peace that comes with it, the peace the interior peace that we feel, that we actually experience emotionally. It's not all, you know, when I get to heaven I'll have the experience, it's right now I'm experiencing things that come with the salvation. So this was a way that Paul compressed the entire gospel message 
and its effect on mankind in just a few words. Grace and peace be to you. Just those few words said everything that he has taught them and shared with them in the, in the past. All right, in the second part of this section, Paul will discuss God's essential purpose when it comes to the church. Now, God's purpose from the beginning of time was to create an entity, and that entity of course is the church, or you can call it the body of Christ, Christians, saints, the saved, the redeemed, the household of God, you know, there are any number of ways to refer to the church. So God's purpose from the beginning of time was to create an entity upon whom, upon which he could lavish spiritual blessings. It's like a rich you know, grandfather who's got everything and he's just waiting for a, a grandchild you know, to just pour his love on that, on that grandchild. Well, not, not a perfect analogy, but those of us who are parents and grandparents understand what I'm talking about. And so the Bible is the account of how God accomplished this. And Jesus Christ is the person through whom He accomplished this. Remember that this here is, I want to give blessings to the church. And the church is that thing, that entity that He did it for. So in verses three to 14, Paul describes the nature of the blessings, the nature of the gifts that God planned from the beginning of time to give to the church through Jesus Christ. So we'll start reading verse number three. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So God blesses or God gives gifts that are spiritual in nature to the church in connection with Jesus Christ. Now the gifts are spiritual in nature. That's one of the things we can tell from this passage. <clears throat> and we can also tell that God has given all of the available gifts. He hasn't held any back. Everything He had to give, He's given. And these things or these gifts are given and received because of and in relation to Jesus Christ only. Not in relationship to Moses, not in relationship to Elijah, and certainly not in relationship to the Buddha. Okay? Or to Muhammad. He says these gifts are in relationship to Christ, in Him. In Christ is the term for this. And so the decision, or excuse me, in verse four, let's read that first, then we'll go on. He says, in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Stop there. The decision to do this thing, give the gifts, was made before the beginning of time. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something said, oh, maybe, maybe I should give something. You know, like that commercial where the husband stops off at 7-Eleven and he gets some gum and he pays for his gas and then he goes, oh yeah, yeah, Mother's Day, yeah, give me, a, give me those flowers there, a buck and a half that are on the counter. You know, it's not like that. All of history fits into his plan to give gifts to the church. And for those of you who were in my great doctrines class, Paul here is, what doctrine is he talking about here? He's talking about the doctrine of election. God chooses Jesus Christ you know, to be the vehicle through whom these gifts will come. And those who are united to Christ by faith, these are the ones who will receive the blessings. That's the correct concept of election in the Bible, and he makes mention of it here in Ephesians. So in verses 4b to 14, 
Paul describes some of the blessings that God has prepared to give to the church. So let's get back to the verse. He says, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. There's the first gift. Those in Christ would be holy and blameless. In other words, without impurity. So those in Christ would be able to look at themselves and see no impurity, no imperfections. You see the gift that that is? Again, it's not just a theological idea. If I can look in my own soul and see no impurity because of Christ, that gives me a tremendous peace, tremendous courage, tremendous confidence. And those in Christ, he says, have no condemnation. So when I look at myself, I see no imperfection. When I look at God, I have no fear. Isn't that the thing we're afraid of? We're afraid of coming before God and being condemned. And he says here, before the beginning of the world, God planned to give gifts to those who would be associated to Christ. And two of those gifts would be perfection, no impurities, and no fear of condemnation. He goes on in verse five and says, he pre excuse me, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. This is, by the way, this is a very long passage. It just goes on and on and on. That's why I have to break it down in pieces. But remember what he's doing. He's describing the gifts that God intended to give to the church from before the beginning of time. So here he says, those who are in Christ become sons of God and recipients of His grace. What does that mean for me in a you know, in a, in, a, in a true sense, not just as a concept, but in my experience. It tells me who I am. You know, these people say, you know, I, I, I quit my job and I, I liquidated my bank account and I just took off because I wanted to find out who I was. I wanted to find myself. Those who are in Christ, they know who they are. They don't have to go to Europe to figure it out. They're sons of God. They're the daughters of God. And in that relationship and in that identity, I find how I live my life. I have my identity. I know it doesn't matter if I'm Italian or American or Asian or black or white. That doesn't matter anymore. I know who I am essentially and I know who I'm going to be forever. So we keep reading, same idea. Verse seven and eight, in Him. Notice he always repeats, in Him, in Him, in Him. He's always saying, in relationship to Christ. So in verse seven he says, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I'll stop there. Those in Christ also have forgiveness of sins because their sins have been redeemed. How? Their moral debt to God because of their sins have been paid for by the death of Christ. What a, what a blessing that is. Again, how do I see this as a blessing in my life? I see it as a blessing because even though my status is perfect with God, the reality of my life from day to day is I continue to sin in so many different ways. This gift here says that my sins, those sins are forgiven. There is a way for those sins to be forgiven as a Christian. We read that in John 
1 John chapter 1, 7 and 8, if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us and the blood of Christ washes over us. But the idea is we have an avenue of forgiveness. It's like a tool that He's given us. He says, now bring that forgiveness thing along with you because in this life you're, you're still going to stumble, you're still going to fall, you're still going to sin. So remember, one of the gifts I'm giving you is you have the avenue to forgiveness. How many people in this world are constantly whipping themselves or trying to you know, purge, if you wish, their own sinfulness and they never succeed. It's like Kleenex, every, every time you clean one up, you know, whoops, another one pops up. That's what sin is like. What a great gift this is. We keep going, verse nine, just one big long sentence here. Uh, he says, and we need to back up just a little bit. It says, in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things upon the earth. And the class said, huh? <laughs> what did he just say? I understand the words, you know, I get the words, but I think you lost me, Paul. What he's saying basically is those in Christ have insight into God's overall plan for man. We're not, we're not walking around blindly, not knowing. Those who are in Christ, they know the beginning and they know the end. They know how it all started, how it all went wrong, how God fixed it, and how it's going to end, not only in their lives, but in, the, in all of life, in reality. Now, it's not stated here in this passage, but basically what Paul is referring to here is that uh, at the end, God's goal is to unite all the saved, the Jews and the Greeks, the Gentiles, to separate the saved from the unsaved at judgment and then to unite all the saved with God in heaven forever. We know the plan. We understand it, we live it. And it's a gift because unless God would have revealed it to us, we wouldn't know what it is. That's the idea of the gift. In verse 11 and 12, we keep going, it says also, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In other words, those in Christ become God's witness here on earth. That's a gift. We're the salt. We're the light. You don't think that's a gift? The church is the vehicle by which God is revealed and through which God is praised. Paul says the church is here to provide praise and to provoke praise to God from other people. That's why it's such a shameful thing that people associated with Christianity, let's just in general, are dragged into court for having, you know, for sexual sins or for having cheated or lied or, or stolen or whatever. It's a terrible thing because by their actions, the world is deriding the church. Now we know the difference, you know, a, a restoration, biblical church, the difference between that and a denomination and so on. You know, we know the difference, don't we? But people in the world, they, they, don't know, they don't make those fine differences. For them, it's all the same. Catholic, Protestant, Church of Christ, Baptist, all the same, you're all in the same boat. You're Christians, you're followers of Jesus, aren't you? So we shouldn't be too smug you know, when another group you know, drops the ball or does something shameful. You know. We shouldn't be too smug because out in the world they're painting us with the same brush. 
And the shameful thing is, Paul says, that one of the gifts that God has given to the church is this is the only vehicle by which He is praised by human beings. Not by the Boy Scouts, not by the US government, not by NASA, not, you don't understand, there's no other organization that He has delegated this task to. And at the end he says, by virtue of its very existence, the church not only gives praise, the church is praise. You don't understand that? I go back to my grandpa example, right? You have your little grandson or granddaughter or whoever she is, you know, little cutie, four or five years old. She walks in and your friends are there, people of the church, and they all turn around and look at her. Do you have to say anything? They all go, oh, look at this, she's so cute. She looks like her grandmother. You know what I'm saying? Just by walking into the room, that little child is praise for your family, provokes it from other people saying, what a little cutie and so on and so forth. Well, you know, multiply that a zillion times. You've got what the church is supposed to be. It is the praise of God and it provokes it. All right, we need to move quickly here, oh boy. Verse 13 and 14, he says, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. So those in Christ have possession of God's Holy Spirit as a gift for their own spiritual pleasure. We've talked about this in you know, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is a delightful thing to commune with God intimately. In addition to the possession of the Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit is the identifying factor that guarantees all of the other promises. We are resurrected from the dead because we have the Spirit. We have eternal life because we have the Spirit. God gives these things to those who have the Spirit, and you know what? He knows whose are His. He knows who has the Spirit. We spend half of our religious exercise trying to figure out who's got the Spirit and who doesn't. That's a waste of time. God knows who has the Spirit. So these are the major gifts that those who are united to Jesus by faith, and we've talked about this before, how do I express my faith and my belief in Jesus? Well, according to the Bible, I repent of my sins, I'm immersed in water, I'm baptized in His name. This is what it means to be in Christ. To be in Christ means to be related to Christ or united to Christ. By faith means I have expressed my faith according to Christ, repentance and baptism. All right, so now he's going to talk about the value of the gifts. After reviewing the blessings that God bestows, Paul expresses a prayer in which he asks God to help his readers understand more deeply the nature and the value of the gifts that they now possess. You know, how many of us have ever said, you, youth is wasted on the, on the young, right? When you're young, you just, you don't appreciate what you have, all that energy. You know, I remember my children when they were teens, you know, or young adults living at home, they go to bed at 10.30 at night and they'd sleep through the night and wake up at 10 o'clock the next morning and they didn't even get out of bed. Well, I've had two or three lifetimes between 10.30 at night and 10 in the morning, if you know what I mean. Well, Paul is praying that the church at Ephesus realize what it has, the value of the gifts. And so he makes a prayer for the church. Verse 15, he says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So because they have been faithful so far as a young church, despite persecution, Paul prays that God will give them the ability to know God more intimately. People say, what is heaven like? I'm not quite sure what we look like, 
But the Bible tells us that heaven will be the experience of having a relationship with God without the hindrance of sin and death. No sin, no death. So my experience of God is full. So he wants them to begin experiencing this phenomenon now. Don't wait till you get to heaven. I want you to taste heaven now. In verse 18 and 19 he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ Jesus. So in this continued passage, he describes in more detail some of the things that he wants them to know about God that will prove to be a blessing to them. So what does he want them to know? He wants them to know the hope that's in front of them. Well, what is that? Uh, eternal life. He wants them to know the riches of the inheritance. What is that? Well, <laughs> eternal life. He wants them to know the greatness of God's power. Well, what is the greatness of His power? He's going to resurrect them from the dead and give them eternal life. So all of these things refer to the same thing, our resurrection, our glorification, and then our exaltation. Three things that happen. We're raised from the dead, we're glorified. Our bodies are changed. We put on a spiritual body. But then there's a third thing that happens that we don't talk about very often, and that's the exaltation. Resurrection, glorification, exaltation to the right hand of God, the experience. The glorified body simply prepares us to have the experience of being with God forever. We could not be with Him in this particular body. It would be like, we'd, we'd probably evaporate, I think, with, because, of our, because of our sinfulness. All right, verse 20, let's finish this out. He says, uh, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. End of sentence. Imagine if you're an English teacher and you were trying to parse that or diagram it, you know, it'd, take, you know, it'd take a blackboard. So in verses 20 to 23, he completes this prayer by describing how these things were acquired and how they are presently administered. How? Through Christ. Those in Christ will resurrect and be with God in heaven because that's where Jesus is now and that's what he's talking about. He died, he resurrected, he's over all, he's at the right hand of God. He's saying where Jesus is, that's where you're going to be. And I want you to understand that as an idea, but I also want you to start experiencing that as a reality of spiritual life. So he prays that they can appreciate more and more the reward that they have been called to receive as disciples of Jesus who guarantees it. How? By the virtue of his sovereignty over all things. You know, I trust the guy who was raised from the dead. That guy I trust. Anybody else? You know, I only have one question for any other prophet. Did you raise from the dead? Well, no. Okay, see you. Bye. You know, my life is with the one who, who was raised from the dead and who promised me the same thing. I'm with him. So here are a couple of things that we can learn from this passage. I think we've learned a lot, but a couple of kind of life lessons or religious lessons. Lesson number one, spiritual blessings are only available if one is united to Christ through faith. So where's the lesson? I need to verify my life if I have faith and if it has been expressed as Jesus would have it. Repentance and baptism. I don't want anybody going to heaven and saying to God, and God saying, well, did you believe in Jesus? Well, I sort of kind of did. Now he's going to ask, did you believe that Jesus is my son, the divine son? He's going to ask, did you obey the gospel? Did you repent and be baptized? Well, you know, I wasn't too sure. Really? How many times were you taught that? After 2,000 times, 2,000 lessons on this subject, you still did not respond? 
I think he'll say, what more <laughs> did I have to do to get the point across to you? Second lesson, spiritual blessings are far more valuable than material ones, yet they are given for free. If we, truly, uh, if we are truly wise, we would worry less about trying to gain and keep material things and spend a little more time in search of spiritual things because the spiritual blessings are eternal. After all, Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, your IRA account, your two houses that are paid off, your boat, will you be able to exchange that for your soul? And then the other lesson is, Spiritual blessings are appreciated and enhanced through the activity of prayer. Paul prayed for them to begin experiencing the joy associated with the blessings that they had. Many times what's missing in our spiritual lives is prayer or prayer to know God and know and appreciate His gifts. Prayer is like the starter. We got all the stuff, we got all the gifts, you know, but prayer is the starter that starts the insight, starts the engine running. We have everything, but many times we're not enjoying it. And usually this is because we don't understand that spiritual things are tasted, they're contemplated, they're experienced in the dimension of prayer, in the dimension of service, in the dimension of worship and sacrifice and obedience. Those are the doors we have to walk through in order to begin experiencing the spiritual blessings that we already have, we have them. So the first step to heaven usually begins by getting down on our knees. First step to heaven. All right, well that's lesson four, chapter one, Ephesians. And I mean, we could go back and do the whole passage again and there's so much more to, to see there, but I think that gives us a, a good overall view. So that's our class for this morning. We're dismissed. Thank you for your attention.